I don't know what I would do, you know, actually without music in my life because it's been such a huge part of my existence. Um, well, I mean, so I'll just go, you know, since the womb, honestly, because um, my mom was a, uh, was, a, was a dance instructor. That's how my parents met. Uh, my dad took a ballroom dancing class from, uh, from my mother here in Peoria. Um, and that's how they met, and they, they went dancing all the time, and they, uh, when they got together, uh, when they were, I have two brothers and a sister. Um, my mother actually uh, taught tap dance and dance, you know, in general, while she was carrying all of us. And, you know, I ended up, you know, we, we ended up settling, or mom and dad settled in Hannah City, where my dad was from. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bass player, and both of my brothers are drummers. So if you try to tell me that there's no transference in the womb, I mean, you know, you see all these uh, people these days with, uh, with, uh, with all those, those, uh, all those, those things they put on the womb now to, to, uh, to interject music, you know, into the, you know, into the womb. Uh, I came by that naturally. I, I have said before that I was subdividing beats in the womb, you know, because of, you know, just because uh, of all of the, uh, you know, all the tap dancing and so forth my mom did when, when we were growing up. And that kind of, you know, I mean, so we were performing family, you know, more, more than anything because uh, with my mom and with dance, I mean, I took tap dance lessons when I was a kid, uh, you know, so I had the rhythm. I mean, I knew, you know, I just, I knew rhythm and so forth. Uh, did tap, did some uh, some song and dance routines with my mom at, at different uh, different festivals and, and, uh, and things you know around the around the area. And uh, then when I got into school, uh, you know you get into fifth grade and it's it's time for band. And of course I, I chose trumpet to play. And right after I, I chose trumpet to play, um, I got braces, and that made it really really hard to play trumpet. So uh, we uh, I switched over to tuba. And that was uh, that was the start of, uh, of something because uh, you know I was reading bass clef. Uh, you know I went through and, and played two all through grade school. When I got into uh, when I got into high school, I had taken some guitar lessons when I was a kid, but it really didn't take just regular guitar lessons. Uh, and I took from people like uh, Bob Miller, uh, Whale, uh, who is uh, a luminary here in the area, a uh, you know, local luminary. Uh, and some other people, you know, in the air, Jerry Stufflebeam. I took from Jerry Stufflebeam, who, uh, you know, is, is uh, someone who had, he had a music store uh, back in the day, and also he worked, uh, he worked out in a few places and played a lot. Um, but it really didn't take. But when I got it, you know, when I when I started doing the, the tuba thing, uh, I got it as a freshman in high school, and uh, you know, all glory goes to my to my music directors in high school because uh, Bill Vanderveer. Uh, the, uh, the music uh, teacher that I had, the band teacher that I had, put a bass guitar in my hands uh, when I was 14 years old. Working through the uh, Mel Bay Pink Book and the Mel Bay Blue Book, I could already read bass clef, but it was you know it's an octave higher, so I had to kind of get used to that. But right after I worked myself through those books, um, I started reading charts. I mean, I was in the stage band, uh, you know, immediately, and uh, it was it was complete immersion. I mean, I was doing nothing but reading, you know, all the time. Uh, a lot of big band stuff. But Bill was very also, Mr. Vanderveer was very good at bringing in things like Chicago and some, you know, some newer things, uh, uh, things that were way above our, you know, our, our pay grade, if you will, or our experience level. It was really, you know, it was very challenging stuff, but it was good. Um, didn't really play in bands that much in high school, but I will, you know, call out the one that I, that I did play in, and that was uh, with Steve Herridge from uh, WH City. And Lynn Garrett, and uh, then with the, the drummer was Scott Bohemus from uh, from the uh, Farmington area, from Hannah City. Um, and we played two or three, we didn't play very much. We only we did only played a handful of gigs, and then, uh, then that kind of that kind of petered out. Um, but after that, uh, I you know playing through high school and playing in the jazz band and so forth. Uh, that that was a constant, and that's been a constant ever since. You know, ever since then. Um, but when, when, I was a, when I was a senior in high school, um, we were coming back from, you know, in chorus, and that's the other uh, person I want to call out as far as formative years is, is Tony Redley Chaper. Uh, she was our chorus teacher, and she taught me, not only taught me the right way to sing, you know, from diaphragm, uh, but she also, uh, you know, instilled in me a love of, of harmony and, you know, taught me the right way to sing. So I could, I could sight read, and I went, I did go to Allstate Chorus when I was a junior in high school. 
was a, which was an amazing experience uh, to do something like that. Um, but on a chorus bus back from uh, the Fulton County uh, Music Festival uh, back in 1978, it would have been my senior year in high school, um, in the fall of 1978, uh, we were on our way back and there was, uh, there was seven of us, Dave Stewin, uh, Greg Rahutsky, Jim Crane, uh, Ron Kimbrell, Troy Roberts, Tim Link, and myself. And they were they they were singing Statler Brothers stuff in the back of the bus. And I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, I mean, wasn't in, that was not in my uh, wheelhouse at all. I mean, I was a rock guy. I mean, I was a rock guy and an R&B and, and pop guy. Uh, I liked, I really, really liked, uh, you know, a lot of uh, well, funk because of the bass lines, obviously. But I was Kansas and Foreigner and uh, in Boston. Ben Halen, you know, and all of those bands that came out, you know, and were doing things in the 70s, those are the bands that I really liked. Uh, but I didn't know how to sing parts. So, you know, when they were singing, I was, I just, I added a low part, you know, to what they just, what I, in the chord structure of what they were doing. And that ended up being the, the you know, what the, what the part was. Um, that kind of blew up into what became the McBark McBarker Boys. And the McBarker Boys uh, were, you know, were around for about 10 years. Um, we did, we started by doing just school functions, uh, you know, with piano. Uh, and we, we did that, uh, you know, from 79, you know, and then, you know, when we all went to, um, when we all ended up going to college, uh, we continued and, you know, kind of built, uh, you know, built the gig structure, if you will. It was a lot of fairs and festivals. And, you know, in the very beginning, we did nursing homes and churches and, you know, different things of that nature. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, we did, we, you know, we enjoyed each other's company. I mean, we, you know, we're still friends to this day. I mean, uh, I, talk, I actually talked to Dave Stewin uh, about two or three times, like at least a month. Um, you know, I still keep in touch with Greg. Uh, Jim Crane and I still, uh, you know, still hang out together, you know, quite a bit. Uh, so there was, it was just a, you know, it, it was, it was lifelong friendships, you know, and then, you know, of course, Troy, uh, you know, we'll get to later because uh, he, he and I, uh, our musical uh, histories have kind of intertwined over the you know, past you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, but with, uh, you know, with the McBarger boys, um, I, I'll tell you, one of my, one of my favorite memories from the McBarger boys was, uh, was honestly playing uh, a nursing home where one of my aunts was, uh, she was, she was there. Her name was Vera Palmer. And, uh, you know, this kind of goes to what I'll, what I'll say is kind of, I, mean, I, I don't I, I like to say it. You know, my family now are in a fourth generation of performers. Uh, my aunt Vera uh, was—they called her the first, uh, the first lady of Peoria Players. There's actually an award in her name that someone wins every year. Uh, it's called the Vera Palmer Award. Uh, and one of my favorite memories is—I is, 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 can still see it to this day. See the smile on her face when we were performing. You know, just you know, and knowing that she oh gosh, she just did. It was—it was awesome. It was just—it was a really, really. Cool I were we're at you know we're at Western Tim Keyswitter and I were at Western and you know we we really wanted to, to play together um, we didn't want to go to school anymore. Um, <laughs> we we wanted to play I literally had I mean and I don't know that it was great advice or not however I did have a theory teacher at Western who was uh, he was a jazz pianist who had played you know, in Chicago for years he actually drew me aside one day in class and he said you want to play and I said oh that's all I want to do is play he said well, you need to get the hell out of court school's going to be here. And I, I was kind of amazed that, you know, that a, a theory teacher would, would say that to me, but I evidently saw something. I don't know. Um, about the same time, uh, there was an ad uh, in the, uh, in, at Brown Hall, which is the music, uh, music building there at Western, and it was for a, uh, it was a, it was for a lead singer. Uh, and a friend of ours who was in the newcomers said, hey, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to do this. And I, and I just offhandedly, I said, see if they need a bass player and drummer, if you will, because, you know, we're, you know, Tim and I are really thinking about leaving. We, you know, we kind of like to have a band. So um, he came back and he said, they, you know, this is not for me. He said, uh, and they don't need a drummer, but they need a bass player. They'd like for you to call. So I called and it was a Galesburg number. And uh, I talked to this guy for a while and he ended up hooking me up with uh, his brother, who was in this band in Houston. Uh, these guys were all from Galesburg, uh, the Galesburg area, they were transplanted down, they were all living down in Houston. Uh, 
Uh, I had a long conversation with the guys. They invited me to come down and audition. Got down there. Uh, I stayed two weeks, and I came back, and I ended up moving down there and going down and playing with these guys. The name of the band was Cartoon. Uh, they had designs on doing nothing but original music, and they had, they had, they had tunes, they had songs. So I ended up going down, and I ended up playing with those guys. I was down there for five years. Um, in the middle of what we were trying to do with the original stuff, we ended up picking up some cover tunes. And the cover tunes that we picked up were, um, they were, so this was 1981. And, you know, I always talk about how um, in 1981, I went to the wrong coast to play rock and roll during the Urban Cowboy Boom, um, which it, it was fine. I mean, I, you know, I, I had a great time down there. Uh, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about life. Um, I learned a lot about music. That band uh, went on for about five years. Like I said, I was there for almost five. Uh, and I ended up moving back in 1986. The band kind of fell apart a little bit. The relationships between the guys kind of fell apart. And I ended up uh, leaving and coming back here in 1986. Really didn't know what, what I was going to do. I had no idea what, what, uh, you know, what the future held for me. I was 25. Uh, but it gave me the opportunity to reconnect with Tim and, and Troy as well. And you know, we kind of we did some trio things for a while, um, uh, some weddings and, and some different things. I don't even know if we had a name. Maybe we just uh, you know we just kind of played around, you know, uh, uh, you know, played some music with each other. Um, and uh, I was uh, you know I was I was hanging around one day and all of a sudden I get a call from I don't even know who it was that called me from the Barker boys. It might have been Ron or Husky. It might have been Greg's dad. Asking me if they if I'd fill in you know, for the bass player. Well, that that was in eighty. I want to say that was probably eighty seven, maybe eighty seven. Yeah, right around eighty seven. Um, I ended up going back into the Barker Boys as the bass player because in the meantime, what had happened when I you know before I left uh, in in uh, nineteen eighty one, they were still had had just a piano player. Uh, when I left, they put a whole band behind. Them. That's when they they did their touring. They had a uh, they had a bus. They opened for KT Oslin and some other you know some other uh, you know country acts. Uh, toured like a three state area. Played up in Wisconsin. Uh, you know did a whole bunch of things uh, that uh, that I did that I was not a part of. Um, when I came back into the band, they were still doing festivals and so forth. Uh, Clay Jinglin was the drummer. I met him. Uh, he was he was 15 uh, when I uh, when I met him, and I was maybe well he's 10 years younger than me, so I was 25 26 years old. Um, met him for the first time, and we we clicked right away. And boy, I just I love the way he drums. I mean, we just we played really well together. Uh, and then uh, one by one, the, the the guys started leaving. Dave Stewan left first, uh, family obligations and so forth. Um, and he, uh, I think that's when he got his job at Northern uh, Bushnell. Um, Troy left, ended up leaving. Troy Roberts and ended up coming back as the guitar player. When he came back in as the guitar player, now you had Clay and myself and Troy and all three of us could sing. Um, so the McBarker boys would book these four hour shows and the band would cover two hours of it. And then, the, and then we'd bring on the McBarker boys and they'd do their, they'd do their thing. And as time went on, um, we kind of wanted to do our own thing a little more. And as a three piece band, I mean, we, and it was, you know, some of it was a money thing because, uh, you know, we were making scale, which was, you know, basically it didn't matter how long we were on the bus or how long we left. It was still 60 bucks and we you know we knew that if we were playing three piece as the three piece band we could probably charge 300 bucks you know and have our own sound system and only play like three or four hours and that was that all the money be ours and we could play stuff that we really like to play and not not travel all over where they were going um kind of coincided with the band with, with the Parker boys ending uh you know which they it was about 10 years they did. They did a ten-year anniversary uh, concert, I think, and it was at the. Uh, that was that was interesting. It was at the. Uh, it was at the Farmington football field at our high school, and they had a Farmington potato chip truck that, that brought them in, and it, they and we played the intro. I'll never forget this. We played the intro to that show for a good five to six minutes while that truck was going around the track, bringing the. Bring the singers on, on the stage. It was it was funny. It was it was very interesting. So the Naturals um, was a was a, a very very fun group to be in. 
Um, we, we tackled things that you really shouldn't do as a three-piece band. I'll never forget, we, we, <laughs> we, we actually, we did all I ever wanted by Santana uh, in that band, three-piece. And actually kind of pulled it off. We did, you know, but then we also did, we did old stuff. We did, uh, I remember one of the songs, and we all three sang lead. I mean, all, all of us sang lead in the, in the group. So it was all, you know, all of us had different styles and different, you know, so, it, you know, everything sounded different. Uh, but we also had harmony on everything. I mean, we did bus stop. We did, we did Bus Stop, did all the harmonies in that. Uh, we did, uh, we like Joe Jackson. We like Look Sharp by Joe Jackson so much that we did seven of the 11 songs on that album. I mean, that in our, in our, in the natural course, and, and people loved it. I mean, they just, we, we ended up, um, Sully over here, uh, Mike Sullivan at, at, uh, at Sullivan's, he liked us so much that he would book us, he booked us all the time. He would book us for after, uh, Riverman after parties because he was really big into the Riverman back then, and they all would go after Riverman games. They'd all go to Sullivan's to drink, and he hired us for that. Uh, you know, all the time we were playing, uh, we were playing at Sullivan's. We did some really cool stuff. Uh, in 1990, WWCT decided to do their final basement tape CD, and uh, Troy, we decided to enter it. And Troy wrote this song, uh, and we ended up uh, recording it on a little Fostex four track. And, and taking it in, we, I think we, we were one of the last people to submit, we were, we were right, down the, right down the wire on submitting. So we, uh, we, uh, we gave the song to them, uh, they ended up picking it for the CD, it ended up being the first track on the CD. Um, when they also then, uh, WWCT was 106 back then, they, they did a big uh, uh, release party, if you will, for the CD over at uh, City Limits. In, in, uh, in East Peoria, and Rick Hirschman, I'll never forget this. Uh, you know, I, you know, I was just, I, I, I was just so thankful that, that we were able to be a part of it. You know, because all the other bands that were there, I mean, they were full bands, five-piece bands, six-piece bands. You know, they and they were all really, really good. Uh, and here we are, this little three-piece band. You know, just standing up there doing our combo thing and, and, and playing the song, the little voice, which is the name of the song. And um, I talked to Rick, and I. I, that night, and I said, Rick, I said, I just want to thank you, you know, for including this on CD. I said, this has been an amazing experience. And, uh, and I said, and also, thanks for putting us first on the CD. And he looked me straight in the eye, and it was very flattering. He looked at me straight in the eye, and he goes, Brett, that, wasn't, that, was, that was on purpose. He said, we thought your song was the best song. And I, I was like, that, I, I could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, you know, we, uh, we ended up recording that with Ken Musselman over in, uh, in, in, uh, in Morton for the CD. And uh, that song we actually ended up re playing not only in the Naturals, but we ended up playing it in a couple other bands after that because it was just a, just a good song. You know, it was just a decent song. Uh, so at any rate, that was uh, the Naturals. Uh, we, uh, we were together for about three years and then Troy uh, ended up going to law school over in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, at uh, Indiana University. And that kind of splintered us, you know, at the time. I ended up forming the, the Willies. <laughs> And uh, the impetus behind me wanting to put that together were all these people that I had collected in the back of my mind, you know, over the years. That you know, I'd say, oh, he'd be kind of, he'd be kind of cool. Oh, he'd be kind of cool. So I, I basically threw six people into a basement, and uh, the people that I threw into a basement were, uh, on drums was Alvin Butler, Alvin, Alvin. I had always wanted to play with Alvin. Uh, he was, he was the true funk master. You know, I've, I've, uh, that guy, saw him in the River City Soul Review, so I can't tell you how many times. And, you know, I would, anytime those guys were playing, I would be right there, you know, watching those guys. And Alvin was a great friend, and, uh, and I just kind of wanted to, you know, I wanted, again, throwing these people into a room, I just kind of wanted to see what, what, what it would sound like. Uh, we had a handful of songs. I had, I picked Steve Payne on uh, guitar, uh, who was played in, in uh, United Groove Theory, and, uh, and some other groups in the area. So we had Steve Payne on guitar, uh, we had uh, Alvin on drums, we had Jim Donahue, who was our keyboard player in, in, the, in the Naturals, on keyboards, and, uh, and a female vocalist that nobody heard of. Uh, this was a, a gal, her name was Vicki Bartlett. Uh, she had come to me when I was in the Naturals, and she said, Brett, she said, I have been doing karaoke, and people tell me that I'm really, really good, but I really kind of like to have a band experience. Have you ever put a thing together, would you, would you, give, me a, would you give me a shot? Well, I did. Oh my God, she, I mean, the, she, the first time she opened her mouth to sing, I was like, wow, 
she's amazing. She was absolutely amazing. Um, as we went on with the Willies, uh, and we started, um, we just had a handful of songs that we had picked. My thing with the Willies was I just wanted to do, I wanted to do, I wanted to do different things. I wanted to do what nobody else was doing. Uh, one of the first songs we picked up was Raspberry Beret by Warren Zevon. I do remember that one. Um, I do also remember, uh, you know, some, I think we were doing, uh, we were doing some Natalie Merchant, some other things. We were doing some of Melissa Etheridge. We were doing some Melissa Etheridge. We were picking some, uh, some female stuff that, uh, Vicky could do well. Started getting a crowd. I mean, it was, people started liking what we were doing. Um, I, the things that I learned in Houston, um, you know, one thing I didn't talk about from the Houston days was our marriage with the radio station. At the time that we were doing, and I'm, I'm digressing here a little bit, but going back to Houston, but the, the tunes that we were doing back in the 80s, which were was Hendrix and Cream and Jethro Tull and Led Zeppelin, um, caught the eye, or the ear, if you will, of a, an upstart um, AM station in Houston. And they ended up kind of coining that term classic rock. And it was all the stuff that we were doing. So we hooked up and we started we, we started doing gigs for the radio station. We started being like a, like a, like a mascot man at the radio station. That kind of taught me a few things, right? Um, when I, so when I got back here, um, in, in booking all those Friday fests, you know, I had I had interaction with a lot of the beverage guys. So George Jacob from Brewers would, uh, you know, stand up backstage with him uh, at, a, at a, one of those Friday fests. And I, I won't forget this either. Uh, it was Dave Jaston who was playing, and you know, he turned to me and he said, "Brett, he said, how do bands get sponsored?" Well, I kind of knew how that happened. The Cool Ray experience. I mean, I just kind of not. I didn't have the Cool Ray experience, but I knew how Cool Ray did it. <clears throat> and I and I told him I said well I said you know um, if you wanted to do something like that I said it's it's kind of a reciprocal situation where the the band gives you uh, so many dates as as you know uh, as as beer dates that you you, know, you guys you know, you, you promote your you know you promote your beer and in, in return for that you give us swag you, know, you give us stuff that we can give away that's branded for with our you know with our logo with our look as your stuff. So that we can throw shirts out to the crowd, so we can do you know do that kind of thing. There might be money in there, so that we can buy a banner, you know, so that we can buy some things that we, you know, that we can't afford, you know, as a as a regular band, that we can save for it, and spend gig money on. So I, I turned as we were talking. I said, George, I'd like to think that maybe if I had something I thought was worthy, you know, that I could bring it to you because I absolutely do that. Well, the Willies ended up being that band. So I went to I went to uh, to George and uh, and asked him if he. We were actually the first band here locally to, be, to, get, to have that designation of a sponsor band. You know, True Debt, who was popular at the time, they went with Coors and, and James Sandwich, who uh, was popular. Who, by the way, James Sandwich uh, opened for us. That uh, they were, uh, it was funny because uh, you know they, um, uh, you know they ended up their first one of their first gigs was uh, it was at Landmark uh, in, the, in the bar area there. Uh, we had a gig there and they opened for us. Um, and you know the rest is history with them. I mean they. You know, more popular than the Willies by far, and more, more longevity. You know, they were together a lot longer. Uh, you know, very good friends, like, very good friends. I mean, they were actually uh, very flattered to dance with them. They actually went to Las Vegas with them. They played with them in Las Vegas once, uh, which was an amazing experience as well. I, I think I, I think we were the first band to play on the Sunday stage, I believe, uh, because it was they did the big unveiling with the Freddie Jones band. Uh, funny story about that. <clears throat> so, uh, Freddie Jones had the one hit that they had, uh, you know, uh, in a daydream. And we actually covered it. We actually covered that song. Uh, I could play a version of that, and I honestly think that it's better than the original. But that's my opinion. Uh, at any rate, we rushed to get our stuff off stage because they were, you know, the stage manager for Freddie Jones was kind of a so at any rate, we, we got our step off, and if you know how this, this, the, the stage is, is set up, there's this ramp that goes all the way up to the, up the side. And we had rolled all of our step off and, and lined it up, you know, there you know, very quickly, so that they, because they were, they were coming in the limousine and they were, they were getting ready to go. When Freddie Jones man walked by our equipment, they looked at it and they laughed. And I was pissed. 
I mean, I was, I was not a happy guy. And I just, I look at the other guys and, you know, while they're walking on, you know, I just, I kind of just, I don't know if they heard me or not, but I just said something. Would you guys like a Grateful Dead cover band last year? <laughs> so at any rate, I didn't, like I said, I don't know if they, I don't know if they heard that or not or, or you know, whatever. But that was something that, you know, that, I, that, that happened that, uh, that, you know, it happened. So, <laughs> but at any rate, we parted ways. And the next day I called Clyde and uh, we ended up putting together a 70s group. And uh, it's, it's basically, it's the nucleus of what is now Cousin Eddie. Uh, so it, it was Clyde Robinson, uh, it's Mark Conley, and Mark Conley is one of the, uh, I mean, to me, um, and I, I think anybody that listens to Cousin Eddie or sees Cousin Eddie would agree with me, he's one of the, the most undersung uh, guitar players here in the area. Uh, that guy had me sold when we played Old Man by, uh, by Neil Young, and we played, we were playing Old Man, and he made that, his guitar, literally sound like a banjo. Uh, and I would, you know, the first time that happened, I looked over to see what, what the heck he was doing. And he, I mean, but he would, what he would do in the song, if you remember, if you, if you think about how the song goes, you've got that long slide, you know, oh, and he would, he would go from that to that banjo sound, you know, just, and it was just, it just spot on. So at any rate, you know, that group was, uh, I actually sang more in that group than I've ever sung in any group before. Um, I sang about 40% of the material. We had a, a, a keyboard player, uh, Kim, uh, Kim Rippey, Kim Thomas. She is, uh, she is, uh, she's out in California now. Uh, she's, uh, she's an amazing keyboard player. Uh, you know, we built on, we just built on the, on the talent that we had. And, and then Chad, my, my brother, was the drummer. Um, and we had, I mean, we had vocals, you know, vocals out, out the butt and that one too. We had, you know, myself, you know, I sang, Mark sung, uh, uh, Clyde sings, uh, Kim sang, you know, we did some things, some female things like, uh, you know, it's too late, Carol King, you know, but it was all 70s. So we did like Answer the Really Like, we did uh, Locomotive Breath, we did, you know, it was all 70s, you know, 70s themed. We did things that I had wanted to do since I was a kid. You know, the guys, you know, everybody in the band allowed me to bring that stuff in. We did the core by Eric Clapton. I mean, that's, that's a song that I've always wanted. One of, the, one of the cool things about that band, we did the, uh, Phil, the St. Phil's uh, Fall Festival one year, and Dave Parkinson was there. And I, and on our break, I said, Dave, you got your horn again? He goes, yeah. And I said, uh, we're going to do the core by Eric Clapton. I said, would you mind come up doing the sax solo? He did the sax solo and, and the core. And that was, that was a, that was a cool, that was a cool moment for me. Uh, but at any rate, that band went on for a couple of years, and uh, in 2000 and and then it's 2001 is when the Willies broke up. You know, then this was called Weekend Update was the name of that band. We went on with that band for a couple of years. In 2003, I got a phone call from, uh, from Jeff from Brokeham. Uh, and he said, hey, uh, you know, he was he had joined Yellow Dye Number 5. Which Yellow Dye Number 5 was Shandle Tasser. Uh, it was, uh, you know, don't remember the, uh, the bass player's name, Waters, it was his first name. Um, it had uh, Tommy in it, <coughs> Tommy Edwards. Um, and I'm not even sure who the guitar player was. Well, it was Jeff. Jeff was the guitar player. Uh, so at any rate, he called me and he said, hey, what are we going to do with something? Would you be interested in trying to take a look at this? So I said, sure. So I, I came over and we were, uh, we were kind of formulating what we would do. And, you know, Tommy, uh, Tommy Edwards is, is an amazing vocalist. I mean, he, you know, he, uh, he nails Steve Perry and he nails uh, John Bon Jovi. So um, it was Shandell and Tommy and myself uh, and Jeff and they were looking for someone to, to play keys and they ended up calling Jeff Logston and uh, that was my first introduction to Jeff Logston I'd never you know and I really didn't know Shandel I didn't know Tommy either you know it was Jeff Brokamp that brought me in uh, but that was the band that became Bubblegum Jack. Come Jack, um, Shandell Tasser, Tommy Edwards, uh, Jeff Brokamp, uh, Jeff Logston and myself um, we started playing out uh, 2000, I want to say 2003, 2004, I think is, is around uh, the time that we started doing it. And, you know, we, we, built the, we built the core of the material around, you know, around Tommy, um, you know, because he did Journey and Bon Jovi so well. But Jeff and I were able to stretch a little bit too. We kind of, we brought some of the funk stuff in that we, uh, we kind of, we did some Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, we did, uh, you know, we did Cameo. I mean, that was a song that I wanted to, Shake Your Pants was a song that I, I wanted to do since I was a kid. We 
we, were, we did that. I'm not sure how well we did it, but we, we did it. Uh, we did a lot of really cool stuff. We just used, we did the tubes. We did, you know, we, it was just a lot of, it was, it, it's, it's the, it's the best bombastic rock show, you know, that I've ever been a part of. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Um, I will say that, you know, the, the youthfulness of, of, uh, of Chandel and Tommy, you know, kind of crossed with, you know, Jeff and I, the old dudes, was, it was a little bit of a, you know, I, I remember uh, one of the guys who ran Soundforce once, you know, uh, when he, it was the first time he went Soundforce, and he said, what do you think? And he said, well, it kind of looks like fathers and sons out there. <laughs> but we had, we had a great time. And we did that, uh, Jeff and I did that for about five years uh, you know, with, with those guys and had some, we had some great shows. We, uh, we played... Uh, Toluca Festival, you know, a couple of times, two or three times over there, and that was, those were some amazing parts. It was just, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun in that band. Uh, just, uh, just, just playing, playing some, playing good music, and, and, uh, and people, people really, uh, really took to it. Uh, you know, because everyone in, in the band, you know, was from people, or little people, except for myself, played in, in Goodfellas quite a bit. Did a lot. Did uh, we didn't do a whole lot of traveling in that group, but, we, but uh, you know what we did, uh, things we did do a lot of fun. Uh, in 2008, um, we decided to put the Willies back together. So Jeff and I ended up leaving uh, the Welcome Jack, uh, as everybody that knows about Welcome Jack knows. I mean, they, they did not suffer at all. Uh, you know, they picked up uh, picked up Ryan Rose and picked up some really good players. You know, every step of the way that they went. There's like three separate bands. separate versions, kind of like the Naturals thing with the separate versions that we had in that group. Um, but, uh, you know, the Willies came calling and we went we went back to that. Now, this this version of the Willies, uh, we actually uh, brought Clay Jenlin back in full time to play keyboards. Uh, and with that, uh, he also, because he's most multi-instrumentalist and, and, and an extremely good musician, uh, you know, on top of being the music director into, at, uh, at Lewiston at the time, um, you know, he also saxophone, he brought a trumpet. Uh, we ended up doing a lot of uh, cake, uh, you know, with the trumpet. We ended up doing, we, we did Cut the Cake uh, by uh, uh, Average White Band, and he played sax on that. It was just, it opened up a, it opened up a lot of different different things for us to do. I mean, we did a lot of the old release uh, tunes that we were known for, uh, you know, but we also brought in, uh, we also brought in some other things that, uh, that we could do. That, oh, we did Alan Parsons Project. We did, I mean, it, the sky was the limit, really. I mean, because when you've got the level of talent, and I will say this, I have just been absolutely blessed to play with, uh, the, I mean, everybody, everyone that I've played with, uh, you know, just stellar, stellar musicians, uh, you know, allowing, you know, allowing the groups and the, uh, and the, uh, and the projects uh, to be able to do about anything we want to do, you know. Twelve, um, the, the, the group kind of splintered apart, uh, mainly uh, because Troy Jones uh, ended up moving to uh, Arizona. Uh, so it took away our drummer, uh, and we just decided that, you know, I mean, we certainly could have, uh, you know, taken Clay and, and, and put him into that drummer spot and, and kept going, but we just kind of decided it was kind of time to, you know, kind of wrap that up. So uh, we did. Uh, we wrapped that up, and Jeff and I continued, um, and with Clay, actually, and put together a short-lived 80s group. Uh, that we called the Jigawatts, and that was with Clay's brother Garrett. Uh, you know, we did that, and then we added uh, we added Jeff Oakley actually into that on in the last uh, few gigs that we did. Uh, you know, as Jigawatts, um, that kind of petered out a little bit too. I mean, it it, uh, it did end up being a little cumbersome going to Lewiston to practice all the time and doing you know just, and you know we were and Clay and, and Garrett were uh, were getting back to uh, putting the Reflex back together, the, the band that they had done you know for a lot of years there. At so Jeff and I were on the hunt again to uh, you know to try to put something else together, and uh, and that's when uh, when Captain Court was born, which is uh, which is the current project. Um, we uh, we grabbed Brad Williamson uh, as a drummer. It's, uh, he's the son of Dale Williamson, uh, who's a longtime drummer in the area. Uh, Brad's great uh, great drummer, great dude. Uh, we picked up uh, Kevin Smith uh, on lead vocals uh, and, and guitar. Kevin is uh, an absolute. I mean, Sings like a bird. Uh, he's absolutely amazing. You know, I, I can't believe that he's not been on something like you know The Voice or something like that. He's just an amazing singer and an 
extremely good guitar player. So now we've got really two really good guitar players and two really good singers with Jeff and, uh, and Kevin. Um, we've got, uh, you know, uh, we've got myself uh, and, uh, and Brad. Uh, Brad ended up leaving the group, and when he did, right towards the, uh, the end of when Brad was in the group, uh, Steve Carell, uh, who was, uh, he used to live in, in Chillicothe, and he was in, in groups uh, like Short Bus uh, and some other, uh, some other groups, uh, you know, in that area, uh, but he was living down in Chatham. Uh, he was doing sound for us, and uh, I had seen some clips of him drumming, and I, we ended up asking him if he wanted to, you know, be the drummer of the group. Uh, he's just an extremely solid drummer. He's got a lot of years. Well, he's uh, you know he's a little older than I am, and he's got a lot of years of experience. He's from Robinson, Illinois, uh, you know, way down south. Um, you know, actually, I mean, you can throw a rock and hit Indiana from Robinson, Illinois. Um, at any rate, he got in the group, and uh, and we in we uh, we played as a four piece for a while. We're more like you on and shuffle than you on shuffle, because you know we would uh, and we do. I mean, Hot Blood Up on Four to run to Keith Urban. Um, but we were loaded into a gig one night, and uh, Steve was saying, man, there's so much stuff that we could do if we had a keyboard player. I mean, can you think of the things that we would be able to do? And Brokamp, all of a sudden, he says, well, you know, Jeff Logston plays keys, and he said that he, we have the best set list in, in, in the area. He said that he'd, you know, he'd, he'd really enjoy it. And I dropped everything I had in my hands. I'm like, call him right now. So, at any rate, push came to shove, and we and, and Jeff ended up joining the band. Uh, I think it's been about three years now. He's been in. Um, the group has been uh, been active now for six. Um, we are rooted in uh, in seventies, really. I mean, you know, we do a lot of uh, you know, a lot. We do we do carry on Wayward Son by Kansas and, and Hot Blood of a Foreigner, and you know, a lot of seventies stuff. So Leonard Skinner, but you know, again, you know, when we're doing when we're picking these bands, you know, I say we do. Skinner. Uh, we don't want to touch Give Me Three Steps. We don't want to touch any of the stuff that we always do. We do uh, I Know a Little and we do Got That Right. Uh, we figure that those are two songs that are a little more challenging. You know, they've got a little bit more guitar interplay. Uh, you got the dual vocals and, uh, you know, in, uh, Got That Right. And, uh, you know, we, we decided that if we were going to do things like that, we're gonna, we do you know, we do things like the Do 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 by uh, the Beats. And, uh, you know, just, just different songs that you wouldn't hear. You know, again, Sticking to that same theme, I've always, I, I've never wanted to be a follower. You know, I've always wanted to be somebody that, you know, I want, I want people to come out and see. You know, if they're going to come out and see a cover band, you know, they're come out and see us. Uh, you know, I want them to walk away saying, "Man, I've never heard anybody do these songs before." Uh, so that's that's kind of the, uh, you know, kind of the impetus behind really almost every band that I put together. I said I really don't want to do that. I want to do it consistently. Uh, this group is a lot of fun. Uh, there's the, there's just a, a, a megaton of talent you know, in the group. Uh, you know we on vocals. Uh, you know Steve sings, so we've got four real strong vocals, vocals in the band. Uh, to that end, we started doing uh, a few Eagles tunes, and we started doing a few more Eagles tunes, and then we started doing a few more Eagles tunes, and now we're to the point where we've, we've got the branding and everything with you know with COVID and the things that have happened you know, in the world, uh, in our world. Uh, we have really not been. Uh, you know, legends, uh, you know, musical legends. Uh, I want to talk about one guy first that didn't grow up here, but he's kind of a cousin of mine by marriage. Uh, his name's Jim Hines, and uh, Jim uh, grew up in Evanston. Uh, he was the, uh, I mean, I'd have to get a map out to show you how we're related. I mean, you know, the, uh, but at any rate, uh, Jim was the top studio drummer uh, for a while in Chicago. And when my wife and I got married in, in 1992, I called him, and he allowed me to go on, uh, on, uh, on a gig with him. To record a couple of commercials, um, he had a bass player with him, and the bass player had—I'll never forget this—he had a Sadowski bass, and it was 1992. And you know, boutique basses were not—you know—I mean, boutique basses were Lubbock and Sadowski. I mean, that was about; those were the ones that were, you know, that everybody wanted. Uh, he had a Sadowski; I'd never seen one, uh, and it was a five-string. And I, you know, he let me play it, which was awesome. Uh, Jim. Uh, so when we were up there, uh, there were two commercials that they did. One was on the United Band Lines, and one was McDonald's. And that was November seventh, of, of, you know, around uh, around the beginning of uh, of November uh, in uh, in nineteen ninety two. Uh, Christmas time. I'm down here, and I'm in my car, and I hear a McDonald's commercial, and I hear the jingle. 
that it was that that Jim recorded, and I just I was like, oh my god, I was in the studio and it was recorded. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Uh, but Jim, uh, you know, I, about two or three years later, I, I was talking to his mom, who his mom did live down here, lived in Latham. And I said, so how's Jim? And he, oh, she said, he's just doing great. He's seeing the world. He's touring with this guy. He got a gig with this guy. You know, and I don't know any of these 60s uh, you know, musicians or anything, but you might know who the guy is. Uh, Brian Wilson. And uh, my mouth hit the floor. I mean, because uh, I, I looked at her and I said, He's the drummer with Brian Wilson for the Beach Boys. Sure enough, uh, it wasn't like two, three weeks, maybe a month later. Uh, they did uh, some with TBS or TNT, I don't know what, what station it was, but they did like an all-star tribute to Brian Wilson. And there's Jim on the drums. And Elton John comes out. And all these guys come out and play, you know, play Beach Boys songs with Brian and play their songs. And he's the drummer. Um, amazing, right? So uh, he actually got to see us a couple of times. Uh, he would come back down here for, uh, for holidays. We had legendary, uh, back then with the Willies, we had uh, legendary back before Thanksgiving turkey jam parties, if you will, at, at Cruisins here on Four Drive. And uh, he came down once and, and saw us and we, we talked. And he, was, uh, he was telling me that you know, it was just it was really cool, you know, some of the stuff that he, that he did. Uh, Fast forward to when the Willies got back together in 2008, and uh, his mom was being put in an assisted living home, so he was coming down here. He was uh, coming off of uh, divorce, trying to be, uh, trying to just kind of get himself back together. And um, he came out to a gig one night. Uh, we played martinis, and asked him, asked him to sit in, and he sat in, and it was a joy to play with him. And uh, uh, both Troy Jones and Clay, you know, immediately like cornered him and wanted, wanted to take lessons, which was uh, but uh, I asked Jim I, at the end of the night, I said, well, hey, would you be favorite? Toss me an email, and, and, and I really like it. You know, you've heard me play. I kind of like you to critique my playing a little bit because I, I'd always, you know, kind of had designs on, you know, on being a professional, you know, uh, bass player and just been really hacking on it. Uh, and he just, the, the email he sent back was so nice. I mean, it was just, you know, he, he talked about, you know, how I took care of the drummer and how, uh, you know, I listened and, you know, and, uh, you know like no placement. So forth. It was just, it was total validation for me. It was just, it was really, really nice of him uh, to do that. Uh, so that's a legend that I want to call out. It's not from the area, but you know, when it comes to area legends, you know, I go back to um, when. Uh, well, I mean, I, I go back to Bill Vandermeer. I'm number one. I mean, you know, Bill Vandermeer, my, my band teacher. He was a bass player as well. I mean, he he was a bass player, and uh, he taught me a lot of uh, in the very beginning. Uh, he is absolutely a legend. This area because he, uh, he, you know, he not only was an instructor and a bass player and a damn fine musician, uh, you know, but he also repaired instruments and so forth. So a lot of people will know Bill from, you know, from repairing instruments and floors in, in different places in New York. Uh, you know, Tony Redding Schaefer, my uh, my chorus teacher. I mean, you know, all glory goes to her for, you know, for instilling in me that, uh, you know, that love of, of harmony. You know, and uh, any band that I've ever met in has had at least two, if not three, singers. Uh, you know, because of that, because the harmony is, is really what sets bands apart, right? Um, if we go into musicians, uh, the first band that I saw when I moved back from Houston was King of the Bands. Uh, and that's Greg Williams, that's Dee Pearson, and that's Mark Moretto. All three of those guys, uh, you know, both have, have legendary status in my, in my mind. Uh, Dee is, one, is just an amazing uh, singer and bass player. How he does it, how he is able, because I, you know, I've always been one that if I'm going to sing lead, I mean, the bass is coming out of my hands because, you know, it's kind of like rubbing, you know, like rubbing your tummy and patting your head. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not Ryan Rose. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, D is, D is just an amazing, and he has had an amazing career, uh, you know, playing, uh, playing music. Uh, Greg Williams, uh, guitar player. If anyone has ever asked me uh, in the past who to take guitar lessons from, it's always been Greg. Uh, because Greg, to me, uh, embodies the, uh, the perfect melody of uh, rhythm and lead. Uh, he can do it all. And he can, he can make a three-piece band something uh, a six-piece band. Uh, just by the way he plays and the way he phrases. His voice is amazing. I mean, he's just, just, a, just a great and a great person. And that's the other thing, too, is all these guys are great. 
Mark Moreto. Mark has Mark's played with Captain Cork. Mark uh, filled in for uh, Brad on a few occasions, playing with us at Captain Cork. Mark is, is, is one crazy man, uh, but he is one hell of a drummer. I mean, I'll never forget watching him and, and uh, kicking the pants and watching him throw sticks in the air and, you know, and catch him and so forth. Uh, you know, if you go into uh, legends that are from here that, have, that are, uh, you know, that I have a lot of respect for, uh, that have, have done it on their own, you know, that have gone out and done it, uh, Denny Smith is one uh, with Great Affairs now in Nashville. I have uh, all, all respect for him. Uh, you know, he's done it. He's doing it. You know, uh, Nick Betcher, you know, down in, uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, Nick is a kid. Uh, his dad, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, his dad brought him out to one of our gigs and he sat in with us one time and played. I think we, we did some uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan or something with him. He's an amazing uh, an amazing musician. Uh, he's, uh, he, I don't know if they're married or not, or if they're, if they're just uh, uh, just significant others, but he, his uh, girlfriend was actually, uh, she was on American Idol, uh, and she's from Chicago area, Paige and Shows. Uh, she's, she's an amazing singer as well. Uh, she's from Chicago area. So, um, other legends that I have a lot of respect for. Um, Cole Cabaroo. Uh, Cole played in, in, uh, in I just, uh, that guy, I mean, I'm just so proud of him. I mean, you know, as a kid, you know, as a 22, 23 year old kid, he was running sound for us in uh, the Willies. And then he went on to, uh, you know, he had his own duo, uh, you know, that he played in. Uh, you know, and then uh, went on to join Bubblegum Jack, and became, you know, became, you know, a, a focal point of Bubblegum Jack because of the way he played and, and his jumping around. I love the reunion shows that we did. I didn't even talk about that. The reunion shows that we did with Bubblegum Jack at, at Mackinac Valley. Uh, so many years, uh, where all of us, all nine of us on stage, you know, and, uh, you know, for the last set, uh, you know, some amazing parties there and some amazing performances, you know, and I've, I've got all due, I've just got respect for everybody that I've, that I've played with, you know, over the years. Uh, but Colt, uh, Colt took all the knowledge he had to move to Nashville, and now he's a very successful, I mean, he's doing it, man. I mean, he's got his own recording studio, he's got, he's got charting singles, he's got a YouTube channel that has so many followers that you can't even count them all. Uh, Darren Bloomfield is another drummer that uh, that I really enjoy playing. So uh, Rock and Billy, I mean, Rock and Billy always put together solid bands. Uh, you know, really good. I, you know, I talked about Alvin Butler, Alvin. You know, honestly, all of those guys that were in that were in the River City Soul Review, Alvin Butler, Joe Rowland, and, and Scott Lick. Scott Ligon. Scott Ligon. I couldn't. Think you know, again, couldn't be more proud of him, right? Uh, because I used to book those guys when they were when he was in the River City Soul Review. And he ends up, you know, going to Chicago, you know, uh, playing in, in uh, you know, playing in a band. He ends up, you know, being, uh, being in RBQ. You know, he's in an RBQ. I mean, with Terry Adams. And if you talk to, to Scott and talk, and, and talk to him about his story, I mean, he will tell you that, you know, his brother, you know, and his, you know, a lot of the original songs that, that Scott uh, that Scott performs, his brother has written. I mean, he, his brother's a prolific songwriter, um, but his brother took him to an NRBQ show when he was a kid, and he said at that time, "I'm going to play with that band someday." When he was a kid, and now he is playing with, with NRBQ and they love tour. Amazing, absolutely amazing. I was I had the good fortune of. Uh, That was cool. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm going to tell you, man, this, this area is so rich with uh, not only just homegrown talent you know, around in this area, but I would stack, I would stack the talent in this area up in the area. Uh, you know, but the people that have gone on, the people that you don't know about, Tim Drummond, you know, I mean, you know, Kenny, you know about Tim, Tim Drummond, you know, from Canton. Slings a backpack over his shoulder, hit, you know, hitchhikes out to California, ends up being the bass player with Neil Young on, on, on a harvest album. You know, and then playing with all those guys from the World Canyon, you know. Prolific, prolific career, right? Uh, there's just so many of those stories of people that have, you know, that have, that are from here that have gone on. Mudbank, you know, I mean, another another homegrown story. I mean, you know, you know the ones that you, you know, I mean, R.O. Speedway, yeah, okay. In all due respect, uh, you know, Dan Fogel, yeah, same thing. I mean, you know, those are the ones you know. There's so many you know, you know, and, uh, and that's what that's what makes this area so cool.
Thank you.